Uh, the next interview is with Jeffrey D. Spickler of uh, uh, Oklahoma State University and a, uh, uh, one of the leaders of, uh, in the HVAC in our industry. Please tell us uh, how it was that you became interested in Ashley. Well, when I was, it was an undergraduate mechanical engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I <coughs> started to take classes in uh, heat transfer and thermal systems, and particularly the thermal systems. I, this was a class taught by Kurt Peterson and with a book by Will Stecker, her, her famous HVACNR professors there. And when I finally got to that, I thought, well, this is really interesting. It was the most interesting thing that I had done. And I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the uh, computer simulation of the systems. And I was also interested in energy-efficient buildings, and I found out about ASHRAE, and I joined as a student member. That was uh, in 1982. Hmm. And I was so interested that uh, I was talking to Kurt Peterson about maybe, I, think I was thinking about getting a master's degree, and he said, oh, well, that's, that's, that's uh, good. And uh, how about, uh, I've got a project that you might be interested in working on. And so he told me a little bit about it, was involved with, uh, well, really sort of two parts. So one, there was a project that was related to measuring convective heat transfer inside buildings. And he was also going to be starting up what was called the BLAST support office. And BLAST was, still is a program for simulating buildings, energy consumption. Blast is building loads analysis and system thermodynamics. He was going to be starting a uh, what he called the Blast Support Office. It was funded by the Corps of Engineers, and we provided uh, support for this computer program and helped people simulate buildings. We worked with a lot of engineers in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and so I sort of had this got on this twofold track of uh, ex doing experimental convection heat transfer work, and uh, that was started when I was a senior. I started. Uh, rebuilding uh, different parts of the apparatus and uh, fixing the air conditioning system and redoing the duct work and all those sort of hands-on things. And uh, So I st started with that and started doing both computer simulation experiments and I really enjoyed it. When I started I had no thought whatsoever of getting a PhD but after I saw what uh, Kurt actually did for a living and he was very active in ASHRAE, I thought well this is really pretty interesting. You, you know, In addition to teaching classes you do all these research projects and you go make presentations at ASHRAE meetings and uh, and uh, well, he did some overseas travel and so on. So I, I thought that was all very interesting and uh, when I was getting uh, finished with my master's degree he, uh, he basically made me an offer as a to be a research engineer and while I, and I could work on a PhD part time and uh, that was really, really appealing to me and I, I started going to ASHRAE meetings. The first one was uh, Kansas City, I think it was 1980, uh, summer of 1984, and uh, since then I've been to nearly every ASHRAE meeting except for a couple that I, I had to miss because of the impending birth of a child. My wife wouldn't uh, <laughs> wouldn't forgive me being, missing yeah. them, but uh, ever since I went to my first uh, national ASHRAE meeting, it was, uh, you know, I've always found it very interesting. There's so mm -hmm. much stuff going on here, and uh, mm -hmm. just from there, I uh, you know worked on a PhD and did research uh, at U of I until uh, the end of 1989. I finished my PhD and uh, started looking. I was looking for a job and I, I uh, interviewed at Oklahoma State. And I knew that uh, Faye McQuiston and Gerald Parker had uh, been there. I knew their book. I knew some of a little bit of the research. I knew that Oklahoma State had sort of history of doing HVAC and our research. And I I uh, decided to take the job there. I thought going someplace that already had an established reputation uh, mm -hmm. in the industry and so on was probably a good idea. And, uh, when I went there I got involved. Uh, well, I started out at the chapter level. I was also doing technical committee work at the national level. And mm -hmm. So my participation seems to have just kept creeping upward. And I did, um, mm -hmm. say I did this was the student activities chair for the uh, chapter for several years, and I was regional vice chair for student activities and on the National Student Activities Committee, and uh, was a, sort of an active member of the TC, a very active TC, TC 4.7 energy calculations, and I chaired some subcommittees, and then eventually I became secretary and uh, vice chair and chair, and uh, let's see, so and since then I've been serving on the research administration committee, 
Committee on the Scholarship Trustees and on serving on the editorial board of the International Journal of HVACNR. And all those things together really are keeping me very busy at, <laughs> at ASHRAE meetings. You're, you're uh, still on the faculty. I'm still on the faculty. And, and what's, uh, what are you doing there? Well, my probably my biggest activity is uh, has been in research, and I've done mm -hmm. research in a, a fair amount of research in load calculations. I actually uh, mm -hmm. started when I came. Faye McQuiston was still on the faculty, and he he had a contract to uh, write the second edition of the cooling and heating load calculation manual. The first mm -hmm. one had been written by. Bill Rudoy mm -hmm. and uh, the TC 4.1 load calculations had uh, put out this uh, work statement and contract to, to write a new manual. And so I came on board on that effort and started uh, developing uh, material for the for this um, manual and also um, some new methodology for the CLTD procedure and so on. I started uh, with that <coughs> and since then I've done did quite a bit of research and, and I'm still doing research in ground source heat pump systems. Uh, developed a lot of uh, simulation methodologies for ground source heat pump systems so that we can simulate them in a uh, building energy calculation program like BLAST or Energy Plus, uh, or Transis or HVAC Sim Plus. We've used a number of different programs, but we've been uh, interested in. Uh, designing not or being able to design the systems using simulation. It's somewhat different than a regular building like a designing a VAV system or something because it depends the system is designed depends not just on a peak day uh, or a few peak days. It depends on the long term what happens over the year, how much heat is rejected to the ground versus how much heat is extracted. Mm -hmm. So uh, we sometimes do 20 year simulations uh, to sort of predict, predict what's going to happen with the ground heat transfer. So, I've done a fair amount of work for the Department of Energy uh, on that and some other sponsors, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and with a manufacturer, Climate Master, and so on to develop uh, new software, new methods for analyzing the systems, and uh, letting people really sort of predict what's going to happen with the system and if it's a good idea from an economic standpoint. And also, there's a as the uh, ground source heat pump market has gone more and more commercial buildings. I think it's mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s it was maybe primarily residential and then there's maybe in the 90s and more recently there's just been an upswing in commercial applications. And so there's more interest in um, what are called hybrid ground source heat pump systems because the typical ground source heat pump system rejects in a commercial building in the U.S. typically rejects more heat than it extracts if you have this excess heat that you either need to get rid of or make the ground loop heat exchanger bigger. And it's uh, generally cheaper and more cost effective to uh, get rid of the heat some other way. So the simulation tools that we've been developing allow us to sort of predict what's going to happen if you put on a cooling tower or if you use the heat for something else like uh, heating uh, hot water for uh, dishwashing or something in a restaurant. So you can look at all the interactions and what happens over time. So that's uh, the load calculations and the uh, ground source heat pump systems and some work on energy calculations are probably my biggest areas of research. And of course, we you know, we teach classes. We have, uh, I guess you could say, four or five classes that are related to building indoor environmental systems and thermal systems. Uh, there we have a very active, uh, well, undergraduate program, but also an active graduate program with a number of master's students and PhD students. And, uh, mm -hmm. So all those things keep me pretty busy, and uh, along with the ASHRAE work and some other society work. I think, uh, weren't you involved in the snow melting project? Yeah, that was a... <laughs> that was an offshoot of the ground source seat pump work, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of interesting project in that uh, the idea the, from my from my perspective came from a uh, former governor of Oklahoma and former senator Henry Bellman and he had the interesting perspective of having early on in his career served on the, uh, the board for the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority mm -hmm. and he uh, tells a has told a pretty good story about how 
you know, he'd be in these uh, turnpike authority meetings and uh, they would say, well, we have to replace this bridge and, you know, it's only 12 years old. You know, why is that? Well, you know, they, because they have to salt bridges much more often than the rest of the roadway uh, they, and that they rely on this reinforcing steel, it tends to leach down and corrode the reinforcing steel. So he had, he knew about this problem and then he, he had gotten, uh, had some interest in ground source heat pump systems and had uh, worked some with uh, Jim Bowes, another ASHRAE member, at um, Oklahoma State and on ground source heat pump systems. So he actually asked, is it, is it possible to use a ground source heat pump system to, uh, to heat the bridge deck so that you could avoid the need to salt the bridge deck? So we worked for maybe six, seven years on this uh, technology and developed a, a working system. And uh, the um, you know it's quite capable of, of working on it. We, along with the ground source heat pump aspect, we also worked on forecasting controls so you could predict when mm -hmm. uh, when the bridge deck's going to need heat. Mm -hmm. It's a it's actually a something that's not just of interest for bridge deck applications, but any sort of snow melting application, if you could forecast when it's going to need heat, you could do a much better job of mm -hmm. melting that. So we developed uh, methods for predicting uh, snowfall. They're not really, I guess you could say, fundamental methods. We're using National Weather Service forecasts, mm -hmm. you know, automatically pulling these automated digital forecasts down and, and then making a decision on whether to turn the system on mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but like many things we work on as research projects, it, the, tech, the current state of technology is basically that it's it works, but it's very it's very expensive. So it's a, it's a little hard to justify, and we're looking at ways we could cut the cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless we find some really good ways, I don't anticipate too wide of application. But it uh, it sounds like it has some some significant justification in. Uh, what it saves in the cost of maintaining the bridge. Yes. Not, not just the servicing of the bridge to clean the snow off of it. Right. But the, but the damage to the bridge from the salt is being. Right. And there's also this, just the safety factor of having oh, it. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of things that, you know, your typical HVAC engineer, myself mm -hmm. included, does not typically think about in terms of mm -hmm. the cost of an accident, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of traffic backlogs yeah. and human life and yeah. so on. So. Yeah, that's. That's something that uh, either highway system or someone else could, could assist in to put together a, a picture of how well this is doing. Yeah, in fact, and it may it may come closer to justifying itself than uh, it would by simply looking at it as a means of keeping it from having to remove snow. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's the ultimate. And this answer. may be the way to start to uh, be able to broaden it out from there. Right. The uh, the bridge gets to be a little extra complicated because you're carrying the load of the piping, but on the other hand, you're not going to have to carry the snow load unless something fails. Yeah. And so it's, um, uh, perhaps it doesn't add much to the weight of the bridge uh, and so on, but it, it does add something to the thickness of the structure and things of that kind. All of those have to be taken into account. Yeah. It seems to me like it would be uh, one of those things you might think seriously about uh, organizing. Yeah, and looking at it as a uh, as a basis for uh, further review as to how the cost could be uh, uh, down to a point where it worked out on more more economically. Yeah, and that's, that's and that's something we are we are continuing are to work on. But, oh, right. but uh, we haven't. I won't say we've reached a breakthrough yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> but no. but it's probably be done incrementally. Yeah. So. Well, there's a few, few things that you can't find a way to to improve as you go along, and usually the improvements can be a uh, can be savings in cost. On the other hand, sometimes improvements add to the cost, and, but uh, again, they have to be justified. But in any event, why well, it's a uh, long term wise, if every bridge in the United States, every major bridge in the United States had snow melting, why well, it would uh, simplify winter driving a great deal. Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead. You, you also, uh, well, I guess we could add to that other other serious uh, slopes, at least on on uh, country roads or or at least on the uh, freeways. Yeah. Uh, where they are likely to snow and ice, uh, have snow and ice conditions. 
So it might be something that could happen eventually, yeah, to a fairly major extent. There's a, there's a need for it. Definitely. If it's economically justifiable, why it, it'll happen. Yeah. yeah, we're still working. So it's on really it's things. really very worthwhile. Well, it's a good thing you've done, and it's uh, worth to see what we can do from here to expand yeah. the concept. Yeah. But that's what Ashley has done all the way along. Yeah. Everything. That's right. And uh, some of the the research. Well, we're getting ready to publish some of the research. Uh, Number of interesting things related to snow melting design in general, irregardless mm -hmm. of say bridge decks. But there's, yeah. uh, as you know, there's Ashray's had a you know moderately active uh, part of the society that you know, small but active part that works on snow melting and uh, mm -hmm. different applications. And we've yeah. been looking at how the design is done and have some new proposals for that. So. Yeah. Uh, well, we uh, where do you see Ashray? How do you see ASHRAE improving, and where do you think ASHRAE is going? Well, I don't. Yeah, I. Well, I think there's uh, several areas that I see, and I'm, I'm sure I just have a very small picture <laughs> of the whole, well, whole thing. But the things that I see are, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time on uh, building simulation and different types of load calculations mm -hmm. and so on. And I think, you know, most of our research is aimed at the methodology. Of, of you know how to do it accurately and so on, but and, and I think that's been very important sort of bedrock or foundational work. But I think the biggest innovations are probably going to come more from user interfaces that let engineers really do um, their load calculations very quickly, but also very quickly do energy analysis, mm -hmm. right? And as uh, you know, and this is coming from areas outside of ASHRAE, of course, but the ability to not only quickly do your load calculation, but also quickly check four different system types and see which one, you know, and which type of options give the best energy performance and the mm -hmm. best thermal comfort and so mm -hmm. on. And I think we've, ASHRAE has spent, um, or parts of ASHRAE, ASHRAE we've spent, the Energy Calculations Committee, load calculations, spent a lot of time in uh, coming up with these methodologies. And, it's really coming from market forces that people are developing better and better, I'll say, you know, user interfaces that make it quicker and quicker for engineers to uh, um, obtain, you know, find find the answer to, you know, what if I try this system? What if I use this system? Is a ground source heat pump system a good application? So I think that's it's going to uh, both, uh, I guess you'd say, speed up consulting engineers' uh, ability to, to check these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know, consulting engineering is uh, like well, like the rest of us. You know, they have to do what's uh, economically feasible, and they can't. Mm -hmm. You know, today, uh, you know, they can't afford to check every possible combination. They have to go a lot on, you know, their experience and so on. And that's you know what they should be doing. But I think that as uh, the user interfaces for these programs continue to improve, I think the the sort of incremental cost for an engineer to check some of these things will fall. I think it will lead to more energy efficient buildings. Mm -hmm. um, another area, and this is, I guess you could say, my own area, um, a little more closely, is I've, um, you know, for a long time, been inter ever since I took thermodynamics, been interested in sort of the, the optimum way from a thermodynamic standpoint to do things. And I think mm -hmm. the, you know, the ground source heat pump systems as they stand today. They, they, they go in that direction, but I think the possibility to, to make use of other heat sources and heat sinks and integrate everything together um, is a, it's probably, it's certainly not something that's going to apply to every building, but there's some very interesting opportunities. Uh, things like gas stations that use a ground loop uh, heat exchanger, ground source heat pump system, but also have the refrigeration connected to it, the car wash heating and use the, I guess you could say, diversity of sources and sinks uh, to minimize the cost and also provide a lot of value. I think there's, there's, room, there's room and a direction to provide some more innovative engineering in using that, that, those sorts of technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a third area is probably what we might generically call green buildings, but just the uh, ability to design buildings that that use a very low energy, and uh, I, mean, I think for the time being, it'll, you know, right now, a very sort of encouraging thing is that market forces are driving this, not 
not people deciding to do it because they're going to save money necessarily, but deciding it would be good public relations to have a, say, LEED certified building, and it's driving a lot of uh, innovation, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe not from the pure economics, but I think that that will fo probably follow later in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, are there any other any other suggestions for uh, bringing more members or more people into our industry, whether they come in the path you did or any other alternative <laughs> path? Well, it I guess is a uh, industry that has a need for people. Yeah, I guess my. Uh, you know, my experience is, um, as a student is probably not the typical path. I think it's a good path if you can get students interested, but I, I don't think I'm probably not the typical student who say goes to work as a consulting engineer. Mm -hmm. I, I think as an industry, um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer is, but what I observe is that um, you know consulting engineer so there's a lot of uh, consulting engineers typically interested in hiring people with experience. A lot of students, when they get out, don't really, you know, they may be interested. I often meet students who are interested in ASHRAE technologies, but, you know, they get out and they have three offers, and none of them are in the HVACNR area. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think to the extent that as an industry we can do, say, internships and um, those sort of interactions where you can meet students before they graduate, I think it's probably the best way for industry to find students and also to bring them in into ASHRAE. Uh, so that would be my, in terms of my, my own insights, that, that would be what, what I would see as sort of the biggest uh, way we could sort of encourage students to follow through and, and join ASHRAE. It's certainly been a, a tremendous society for, for my own uh, mm -hmm. career in terms of uh, meeting people and having all kinds of interesting opportunities that uh, things that you know really appealed to me when I saw what uh, Kurt Peterson was doing I've had those opportunities in, in uh, uh, many times over through ASHRAE so well let's see I think it's a good industry I think so I've been in it for a lot of years <laughs> so I'm uh, it's, it's mostly past history with me now not future but anyway by it uh, I see it having a good future Oh, I think so. We're, uh, we're not going to, uh, green buildings will work if the people are comfortable. Oh, right, absolutely. But if they're not, oh, no, for they're, <laughs> not going, they're not going to live in that building yeah. in an uncomfortable condition with it, uh, no matter how green it was. That's right. No, I agree wholeheartedly. Well, that's, that's something we have to understand. We have to do a good job. Yeah. Okay, I guess that really finishes up. Thanks for all done. Thanks for your time.